Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy three sixteen. We love John three sixteen. We need Second Timothy three sixteen. Thank you, Lord. Second Timothy, the third chapter and the sixteenth verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. That also means thoroughly, complete, completely through. Not half baked. Truly furnished unto all good works. Amen. So there's a lot here in these two verses. We'll take at least this one word this morning correction. We all need correction. We all need to make corrections. We all, every one of us, have a problem. We're human. Sometimes people use that as an excuse. God knows he made me this way, they say. No, sin is in the world. Sin has had its mark on all of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We want to have mercy for each other. We want to show mercy to each other. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall... Obtain mercy. Amen? God is going to show mercy. He is merciful. And he's going to show us mercy. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, He's going to show you mercy. But one day, He's going to judge you. And if you've showed mercy, He's going to show mercy. But if you haven't shown mercy, He's going to judge you according to your works, according to your deeds. So next time you feel like... Mm, Ask the Lord to help you. That, that human part happens to every one of us. You need God. And sometimes it's worse on others than maybe you. Maybe you are just kind of naturally good-natured. And that can be a plus in some areas. And then when it comes to correction, you know, sometimes people are so nice. They make no corrections. That's not true love. Now, the other hand, no, the Lord put a lot of padding down here. Amen? He says, spoil the rod, you spoil the, ch uh, spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. One lady wrote on, a, on the rod, uh, correction to be applied to the seat of learning. And she hung that on the wall. Help her children learn to learn, learn better, learn quicker. I always, you know, when, when your daddy says bend over, no matter what, no matter who you are, just this tendency is when you get hit, it straightens you out. And now straighten up. I just did. But more than, more than trying to escape the belt. Amen? Straighten up. Straighten up. And that's exactly what this word means. Straightening up again. Now, how many times it took the rod to get us to straighten up? We don't always hear the word of God and obey him because we know better. Sometimes it takes the rod to straighten us out. And God is so merciful and, and he's so wise, and he's good at bringing correction to our life. I'm going to read this again, but focus on that one word, correction, today. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, Unto all good works. Correction. 
looking mainly today at this word correction. In Job chapter 37, Job 37 and verse 13, you read in Job 36 where Elihu began to speak to Job and bring some good advice. Now, it's, it's good to have good advice, but we've got to make sure, are we using it with mercy? Are we, are we being led by the Holy Ghost? Are we just frustrated with people? Are we just seeing how sorry they are and they're trying to straighten them out? We don't always see, maybe we are worse in that area than they are sometimes. The Lord called them that type of person, hypocrite. Somebody that does worse than those that are trying to correct. Now, that doesn't give us right to go around calling people hypocrites. Uh, they may be a hypocrite, and Jesus did call them truly. He wasn't making a statement or just calling them names. They were hypocrites, and he was trying to help them. And today, in the hour that we're living in, the day of grace, and, and who we are and where we're at, um, there's times for strong measure. But how do we live our life? How do we make corrections with mercy? I don't find myself helping people just, you hypocrite, you. When I start out that way, or even end up like that, it doesn't really help them. Jesus knows what he's doing. He knew everything. He knew what to say, when to say it, and it's perfect, and it was recorded, and you can read it, and it's inspired of God. To be written. It's good to know that people are hypocrites, but we have to recognize the hypocrisy in our own heart, pride in our own heart, weaknesses, faults, failures, shortcomings. Um, if you notice more and more about Christ, you're going to find that we are less and less like him. And the only way to become like him is let him make us that way. And, and you don't just sit there with your hands folded and say, Lord, I'm waiting. Hurry up and do it. No, there's things that you need to make correction. That is, you respond to his inner workings. Like Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is, you be very cautious of your need. You be very aware of your weakness. Become aware of that, not to just accept it, but to realize that I do have a weakness and I need his help and I can't learn to live with it. And just because people around me are nice and they don't deal with it, um, I'll just uh, forget it. Nobody will bring it to my attention. I won't bring it to the Lord's attention. We'll just act like it's not there until that thing festers, until it, it gets too deep. And you can't even control yourself at times. That's how sin works. Now, the lesson, I don't know if we'll get to that part, but I try to at least put it into writing so you can take it home and study it. Because we're not just doing a Sunday morning sermon. We're not just looking to just find things to talk about. There are corrections that must be made in our life. When people don't like correction. Who does? It's embarrassing. When you find out, hey, I need correction, and there's two or three people around, especially in a crowd, it's embarrassing. Amen? But our intent cannot be to embarrass. But just because I have a good intent not to embarrass you doesn't give me the right to just be quick and embarrass you. The Bible says not to offend, not even the least now, if you do it on purpose, he said it would be better for you to have a millstone hung about your neck and cast into the sea. But he, James talked about if you're a human, you're going to offend people with your mouth, with your tongue, until you're straightened out inside. It's just going to happen. And so I need correction. I need repentance. I need humility. I need honesty. I've got to be more careful what I say. I've got to be very careful. Now, there's people constantly trying to correct me. And I appreciate that because I want to be right. I want to be right. And if I get offended at them for trying to correct me, 
The scripture speaks about a wise man can receive correction, can receive chastening. And some, they fight correction. So in Job 37, verse 13, he caused us to come down, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Now we're taking this verse, not to just grab a verse out of Psalm, uh, Job 37, but taking this verse in light of the two chapters, chapter 36 and chapter 37, he's showing the wisdom of God. He's showing the power and the authority of God. He's speaking about his eternity, his everlasting mercy and help. He's dealing with how good and great God is. And he's trying to show Job that he needs correction. And God does it in such wise, plentiful ways. And he, he uses the snow, the rain, the small rain, and the heavy rain, the large rain. He talks about that in, in Job 37. And then it comes down to verse 37, verse 13, chapter 37, verse 13. He's saying, he causeth this rain, he causeth this type of judgment with mercy to come down, whether it be for correction or for his land or for mercy. In Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1, Hosea 6 and 1, down to verse 3, this is Hosea 6 and 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal. He will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. Now, many times you'll find before God wounds, he'll warn. And when there's a torn or there's a uh, hurt or pain or harm, it's because we have resisted, we have rejected, or we have neglected the word of God in some way. The Lord is calling back those that have been torn, those that were smitten. He says, come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal. He'll heal us, he hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. The third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. We were living in that time that was prophesied. And verse 3, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain. He'll come unto us as the rain. Again, not only in Job 37, but here and in many other places, is showing that God's dealings and correction is related to the rain. Now, the next time it rains... Um, it rains on the just and the unjust. And remember also, the Lord didn't come for those that are righteous. Those that think they're righteous is what he's saying. He come to those that know they're not righteous. They know they need help. So don't ever fall into the category, I'm righteous. I don't need help. I need help. Now, what the devil does, he tries to get you over here. You be righteous, like you don't need help. Or you go over here. You're just a sinner saved by grace. You're not perfect, just forgiven. So those are the devil's lies. The truth is, God has a plan to speak to your heart, to bring repentance to where you can be free, not only from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. So that sin has no dominion over you. That's only possible through Christ. As Christ is obeyed. And you've got to keep your heart tender. Because when the Lord speaks to you. And you bristle out. Well I'm only human. I'm not perfect. His way is perfect. His word is perfect. In fact our text this morning. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. Is saying. That the man of God may be perfect. God has a plan. God has a purpose. We read in Job 37 verse 13. He causes it. There's a cause. There's a purpose. God's purpose is that we be complete. Thoroughly or truly. Completely. Amen. 
changed by his power. And the word there is furnished, which is another word. Um, sometimes people uh, take things so quickly and they forget about the more important stuff. I don't know how you furnish your home, but you furnish it to your likings. But when it comes to your soul, it's not my will, but thy will be done. It cannot be, oh, because I like this, and I like that, and I like, no. We need to know the will of God. And you're going to find that you need correction in areas. You're going to like things. The Lord says, don't like that. Don't do that. Don't be a part of that. Why? Especially when a lot of other people are doing it. Especially when you like it. We need correction. In, in Hosea, I want to finish verse 3, chapter 6 and verse 3. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, and as the latter and former rain in the earth. And you can read in Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, where most people read verse 28, which is going to take place in the first three and a half years of the tribulation hour, where the Lord is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. That's what the scripture shows over and over again. But before the tribulation hour, God is going to pour out his spirit, both the former and the latter rain, in the first month. There's going to be an outpouring of God's spirit to prepare people. Now, the moving of the spirit is absolutely necessary to prepare you to please God, to obey God, to attain to the things of God. But if you don't know the truth by the Spirit, you won't know the leading of the Spirit. They that are the sons of God are led by the Spirit. Or they that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. They listened to the Spirit. They heard what the Spirit had to say. It was the Word of God, the things that Jesus said, Jesus promise that. He said, the Holy Ghost is another comforter. He'll take the things of mine and show them unto you. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. And when you don't walk in the way that he says, this is the way, walk ye in it, he'll bring correction. He helps you. He leads you and guides you. He is a comforter. Not a miserable comforter like Job found out his three friends become, but the Holy Ghost is that perfect comforter that will counsel you, that will correct you. I want comfort. You need comfort. And the comfort that he gives is necessary, uh, not so much that you learn how to go around and correct people. That'll come. But if you can't comfort somebody with the comfort that God has given you, you want to be very careful trying to correct people. Because if you're not correcting yourself properly, it's an indication you probably aren't going to be bringing proper correction to them. But the Lord knows how to give proper correction every single time. And so when he brings rain, it's to bring that seed to partition, to Bring that fruit out of that seed. And if we don't have seed in the ground and it rains, you've got mud. You have wet ground at its best. You may get green grass. But it's going to take more than green grass to please God. The grass will wither very quick under the heat of God's sun. And so we need to have fruit growing and developing. Amen? Nebuchadnezzar, didn't listen to God, rebelled against God, got proud, become hard in his heart, and God made him like a beast to go out and eat grass. It rained, grass grew, no fruit. The Lord said, Nebuchadnezzar, you'll eat like a beast in the field. And that's where he was until he humbled himself. And I pray that we'll not have to have such hard measures to get our attention to Humble ourselves before the Lord. He gives grace to the humble. And remember this. There's going to be times where you go through some hard times. You've been humble. In fact, 
your humility could be as God's testimony, pleasing to him, to where he could say about you, as he said, Joe, perfect and upright. Perfect and upright. But in the area that the Lord was going to take him, take him he was untested. He had not yet learned. So uh, you're going to find that in areas of growth, in areas of progression in your life, you're going to need God again and again and again. You can't just say, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm set. That attitude is going to get you in trouble. When I was a child, I heard the testimony, and I appreciated the fact that God was doing something in their life. But I watched the testimony stay to a point to where it wasn't progressing. It was like, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, ready to go to heaven. And that become a testimony that could be heard 20, 30, 40 times in one service. And somebody else. It happened like popcorn. You know, just happening. And it's exciting when somebody's saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, ready to go to heaven. But if you if that's all you know, and that's all you say, and that's a, in a time of growth, and you don't have more of, I've been refreshed. I've been refilled. I've been repenting towards God. And through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I have progressed. Amen? Amen. Things that not thought of to be sin. Now the Holy Ghost has sanctified my heart. You can't do those things. You can't go in those places. You can't be a part of that. And, and everybody looks at you like... You're nothing. You're a nobody. And if you're not growing, you could get into a place like you even think that you're holier than thou. And you're separating not because you're following the Lord, following on to Noah. You're separating because you just don't want to be worldly. You separate yourself just because you don't want to be like them. It's got to be following him. And we need to always be in correction with this mercy so that the Lord could say, turn away your eyes from me. Go into the deep, dark valleys of life. Go into the highways, the byways. Go into places where people are bound by sin and darkness and bring them to the place of refuge. Bring them to the place of victory. Amen. The Lord can't trust somebody that's got darkness in their heart to go into the darkness, to bring them out of darkness into the light. So we need all darkness, whether it's pride or just hesitance the smallest things it makes us hesitant lord correct us hosea chapter 10 and verse 12 sow to yourselves in righteousness creep in mercy that's what i thought of last night brother. Creep, in mercy. creep in mercy no it doesn't say that the man of god says that to help us not to be creeping in the promises not to just creep along when god has made the new and living way, wide open. Amen? Hook up the horses. Let the load be as heavy as can be. Our God can handle it. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Amen. Take those burdens, take those struggles, those weaknesses, those things that need correction. Amen? Rather than just creeping along. You know, some people pride themselves praying in that manner. And they brag about it. They brag about how much they pray and, and how long they pray, which, which praying a long time is very important, but let it not be the Pharisees out of just saying prayers for a long time. Amen. Let our long time in prayer not be, Lord, give me, uh, Lord, just do for me. Uh, let there be repentance. Let the Lord pour out his spirit upon your heart to cause that righteous word to come to perfection. Make the men of God perfect, fairly furnished unto all good works. Amen. And, and then bring you to a place to where you can pray for others. Like a Job, when he prayed for his friends, God turned the captivity in his own life. He, he got his eyes off in himself and off in his problem and on to the Lord. As it was given to us last night, Paul got his eyes off in his problem and on to the Lord. And his problem got worse. But that's all right. Grace ministered and was sufficient for the worst problems. Some of his worst problems came. You know, it isn't just somebody throwing stones at you that bothers you. It's false brethren. And even 
even beyond the false brethren, is when true brothers fail, when true brothers aren't being restored. He said, when you see your brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. But take heed, lest thyself also be tempted. Tempted to do what? Tempted to get frustrated with them because uh, the victory is theirs. The promise is theirs. They've testified it. They've preached it. They've lived it. And now they're in a position like they think it doesn't work. And it, and it gets difficult when people that are close to you and once close to God get away from God. Those are the harder trials. But Paul said, his grace is sufficient for me. God didn't place Paul on the earth to fix everybody's problem, but he did put him there to be a help. He said, I'm a helper of your joy. He said, the Lord has given me authority and power for edification and not for destruction. And at times, it looked like he was using that in a wrong way. I think that was one of the reasons why John Mark left. As soon as his feet hit the ground, he went back home on that first missionary journey because Paul had prayed that a man that was hurting another man's faith and was standing against it, he smote him with blindness. And was John have a weakness and he didn't want to be smitten with blindness or whatever, like a Demas, he forsook Paul for the love of this present world. People get ideas and they get opinions that are so far from what God has for us. And we need correction. Amen? Do you and I need correction today? Is there correction? We can reap in mercy rather than just creep along. If there's any development at all, if there's any progress at all, I've said many times, if I see somebody grow that much, I'm excited and I appreciate that. I'm going to be patient with you as long as I see progression. But when it becomes to where it's stagnant, when it becomes idle, it's dangerous. Idleness is dangerous. You don't have to be just give yourself 10 seconds. 10 seconds, look at the wrong thing, uh, look at the wrong person, or uh, just let your mind wander for 10 seconds, and the devil can see that door open and attack you. Now, um, I talked with two, a family, three, a, a mom, a dad, and a child, uh, a young boy. He was like 22 years old. And not a boy anymore. He's a man, 22 years old, been working with his father and well off. But his father got into a condition for, for six months in a fetal position like a baby for six months. Deep, dark depression filled his life. He couldn't have light on in the bedroom. He had to sleep in darkness and he didn't sleep much. But he laid in darkness for six months in a fetal position, depressed, so depressed. And they were trying to figure out what was gone wrong with him. His wife and many of around him told him that it wasn't demon possession because the devil can't enter into a, a, a vessel of, of the Lord. Um, and I believe that if the blood is applied, he can't come against the blood. But when we open the door through pride, through neglecting God's word, not just rejecting it, by neglecting it, it leaves the door open. I find fiery darts sometimes hit my mind. Immediately, I know, like Paul said, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. But how many people, they don't, they don't know it, and a fiery dart hits their mind the first few seconds they're thinking about something, they wonder where it comes from. Oh, I guess it doesn't work. I guess the gospel don't work. I guess I'm not saved. Somebody just said that the other day. I guess I'm not saved. No, you live by faith. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. When that thought comes against your mind, you shoot it down. And what right do you have? The word of God. The word of God is like an arrow of deliverance. You keep shooting, and the word of God will always prevail. It's when you stop shooting, and you just get idle, and the devil starts shooting at you. His dots are fiery. They're filled with doubt. They're filled with unbelief, filled with sin in, any, in every measure. So... We have a fight of faith. It's a good fight. It's not fist to cuff. It's a heart relationship where you believe God. You obey the Lord. 
Hosea 10 and 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Till he come and rain, is that rain again, rain righteousness upon you. Deuteronomy 32 and 1, he talks about, in verse 2, he's talking about the rain and the dew of the word of God. It comes down like the dew. It comes down like the rain. A small rain sometimes. It's just a peaceful rain. But then, then there's times of heavy rain. Do you know in heavy rain, it's for the just and the unjust? And some will be in the same service. The rain of the Holy Ghost falls. Some leave blessed and others leave mad. They have the same experience as far as opportunity. To receive an outpouring of God's spirit, some leave blessed and increased in their vessel is just hungry for God, thirsting for God, filled with the Lord, and others leave, I didn't feel anything, I'm mad and angry. So the judgment of God is in the rain, and his judgment is perfect. And if you're in a position where you don't feel good, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Sometimes I feel so bad, I'm, I find myself quickly, Lord, I need your help. Please, God, help me. And I have to correct myself because I know God is my helper. And I know God has helped me. And I would say immediately, Lord, forgive me. I know you're helping me. So there's something inside of me that's like I feel empty. I feel in trouble. I feel sometimes even like you, the feeling is like you feel lost. But I know I'm not lost. I know I'll be lost without him. I know I would lose everything I had without him. And I have to take dominion over that thought and that feeling. Amen. Correction is needed. Correction is absolutely necessary. 2 Timothy 3.16 is our text. 16 and 17 is our text this morning. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable right down to that word correction. We need all these things, but we're trying to stay with the thought and the word today, correction. You look up that word correction, the Greek word is, I can't even pronounce those Greek words. I don't talk Greek, but I appreciate men that do understand Greek and Hebrew languages to give us in writing so that we can compare Scripture with Scripture. See, and the meaning of these words is so powerful. It actually means a straightening up again. Remember the belt hits the bottom, and, and you hit them hot enough. You hit them hot enough. See, if your child don't straighten up when you hit them, you didn't hit them hot enough. Johnny and Danny and Kevin put magazines. Oh, Johnny didn't, I guess. Johnny did. I won't tell you the whole thing. But Johnny's upstairs later laughing because he didn't wear magazines. Danny was not laughing because Daddy found out by the sound. <laughs> Oh, I Daddy, I won't do it again. Daddy, I won't do it again. That's what we do. Screaming. We should have been thinking of that before. So if they're not straightening out, you didn't give it hard enough. Now, some people beat their children. I know that. And um, but there's a true correction. And we're looking at correction. We're looking at the way it means straightening out again. Do you ever, do you ever remember the young days? I remember, Daddy, I won't do it again. Daddy, I promise him I'll never do it again. Um, that was one of my loud, loud cries. And I meant it. And I tried not to do it again. But he let me know he meant it too. And he straightened me out again. <clears throat> That's what it means, correction. You get corrected in church, and it's embarrassing. You feel ashamed of yourself. But if you don't listen to the word, you're going to go right back and do it again. And Zechariah, or Ezekiel, 
Ezekiel, I believe it's in chapter 43, he told them, he says, show the house to the house of Israel. The house that he was talking about is the house that God was revealing to Ezekiel by the Spirit. He says, show the house to the house of Israel, and if they are ashamed, begin to give them more details of the order of the building of the house. There's some people, they don't want to admit they're wrong. They don't want to change. They sure don't want to be ashamed of their wrong and, and be embarrassed. Um, if, if we're doing wrong, we need to be ashamed of it. We need, we need conviction. Now, I read about the mourner's bench, and I believe that part of somebody being real and honest, you know, some people today, they come in, they have prayer, gone. If you really mean that, he's, his word, every word of God is true, and God's word works in your heart. But they learn, like Israel, God will speak to them, bring correction to them, and they constantly rebel. They constantly fell back into sin in the world. So they brought out a mourner's bench. And he says, you're going to pray in that altar until we see a change in your life. You're not going to be able to profess Christ as your Savior and be able to sing in the choir, be able to testify, be able to be a part of this church until you're right with God. I believe in being right with God. But I thank God for mercy today. Amen. Amen. Um, I believe that the Holy Ghost can save you and fill you and dwell in you in one service. I believe that. I don't believe you have to get saved one day and 10 years get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, some people go the other way. They believe that the Holy Ghost indwells you at salvation. That's a gift. The gift of the Holy Ghost is a separate gift than salvation. The oil is applied where the blood is applied. But the blood has to be applied first. Christ dwells in our heart by faith. We receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And you can, after you receive Christ as your Savior, you can receive the Holy Ghost. You don't receive the Holy Ghost in before Christ. And Christ is not the Holy Ghost. And we're not here today to talk about the doctrine, but all scripture is given for doctrine. And part of correction is understanding right doctrine. So I'll give you a few things. I might not hit your weakness. I may not hit how you look at things today, but the Holy Ghost is faithful to do that for you. If you can recognize the part that you need correction, you need constant correction. Not somebody nagging you, not somebody thinking they're better than you. No, I'm not condescending on anybody. Paul said in Romans, the 12th chapter and the 16th verse, he says, condescend to them, but not on them, not ever at them. Get down right where they're at. If you're living right for God, you're spiritual, you understand the things of God, then you be there for them. And you be with them. Amen. So it's a straighten, a straightening up again. I need that. I want that. And again, we're not going to get off the first page today, but we need straightening up again. We need straighten up again. Now, this is stronger meat, and you've been so patient with me. Um, I'll, I'd like to turn to the last two verses, the last part of the notes, so that when you get to that study, you won't think it's just something, random words, random verses, random thoughts. But Jesus was very wise in bringing correction to people. Again, he didn't just call people names. He recognized the hypocrisy. He recognized the pride. He recognized the covetousness, the idolatry. He recognized our every weakness. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But he also recognized the works of the devil. He never gave praise to the devil. At times when the devil would speak, he'd shut his mouth. He'd shut him up. He would tell them, go. He'd sometimes just speak a word, go, and they had to leave. And other times, he's not just dealing with demons. He's dealing with Pharisees. He's dealing with people that they're never going to learn. They're never going to be corrected until something wakes up inside of them. Nicodemus had a little bit of waking it up here, but he needs to get down in here. 
And thank God by the time of the cross experience, I think, I think Nicodemus had something working in his heart. I don't just look at him as a man that came by night and had a few things to think about and never changed. You look in chapter 7, there's, there's somewhat of a change, but it needs to be more than just speak, uh, speaking up and just talking about the things of God. You need to do what God wants you to do. And that's what I see Nicodemus doing with a 100-pound uh, weight. One woman had one pound. It was like a year's wage for her. That was like a w year's wage, not just for her, but uh, for many of them. Um, here, here, him and Joseph have a hundred pounds. It's like a hundred years wages. And we're going to put it on the body of Jesus. Prepare him for, for his burial. <clears throat> we, ne we need a real inner heart change. So these last two verses, I'm going to just give you the gist of it. It says, not furnished. We read in 2 Timothy 3.16, what? Furnished. Wasn't furnished. Garnished, not furnished. You know, there's a lot of houses fixed up. Brother Luke fixes up some houses. It's not really a home until people move in. It's a house or an apartment. Brother, Brother Robert mentioned it the other day. He's, look, he likes looking at nice houses. And he said, I hope their home's inside. So Jesus brought that illustration to them. He said, there are, there are many of you, like this last day generation, garnished but not furnished. The demons would look and see that it's empty, swept, and garnished. Empty has to do with unoccupied. It's vacant. The door is open. People can look in. Demons can look in. They can see what's nothing's going on. It had been swept and garnished. Looks good. Looks the part. But no business going on inside. So don't ever let the devil find you in an idle mind. Because he has a plan. He goes out. He might have been there before, but he's driven out. He sees garnished, not furnished. What do we learn today? If we're obeying God's word, now I know I've said a lot and I have a few unfinished stories, but I try to give you enough to get your attention to study, study the word of God, know the truth. If you have any question, we have all week long to talk about those things. Our time is, at this time, is make sure that we are furnished, not garnished. Um, you read songs, you read Books, you, you, you hear people preaching and testifying about the devil can't cross the bloodline. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're filled, you're always filled. You hear those things? No, the Lord says we need continual correction. Because if the devil sees an idle mind, whether it's five minutes or five days, he goes out and he seeks seven worse than himself, more wicked than himself. You ever have a wicked thought come? And then all of a sudden it's like seven times worse than ever. But thank God you knew the power and the blood of Jesus to defeat every wicked, evil thought. You don't have to live under the oppression of the devil. You don't have to be beaten down and torn and ripped apart and defeated. You have victory through the blood of Jesus. But if you give yourself to that thought, he can come right in and take over. He's a liar. He's a trespasser. You look up the word devil, it says diabolus. It means traducer. What's a traducer? A traducer is somebody that attacks people's character, that goes in and slanders, finds fault, begins to gossip. So don't do those things. That's the character of the devil. Don't slander. Don't fault find. We need correction. Yes. We need correction. Now there's the place where you see your brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, not, not you that, I'll oh, give them a piece of my mind. No, they don't need a piece of your mind. What they need is God's mercy. 
They need the love of God. And not this charismatic style of I love them and they and they cover up things and sweep it under the rug. We're talking about somebody that understands the love of God that, that deals with it properly. Right. Somebody that really loves you, they can talk to you and talk to somebody else and that somebody else doesn't even know one thing about you. That you can trust them with confidence that they're not going to run you down when behind your back. And if you've got this feeling inside sometimes, then maybe I'm part of that. Maybe I'm not, I might not be the one speaking it, but maybe I'm the one lending my ear to it. Right? So we need correction. We need correction. And I know 99% of the people that really need to hear it didn't come today. Is that true? Yes. No, we, we need it. And it's those that hear the word, and not just hearers only, but doers of the word, that allow the Lord to make the necessary changes. You're going to overcome with the power of God's word. This generation, you read the scripture there, this generation is going to be overtaken by demons. We don't give no glory to the devil. He's a liar. He's a thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But if you're opening the door, you're leaving the door open. He can come right in. So how do we close the door? I can't do that without his help. Do you know God closed the door for Noah? And then he told him he could get out, but he didn't open the door. He didn't open the door, he closed Noah had to get out of the ark. How did he get out? You know, some people think God opened the door. I'm not going to split hairs over how Noah got out of the ark. I'm more concerned about how people are falling out of the ark. How people are leaving the door open to the devil. The scripture is very clear that this generation will. The spirit speaks expressly that in the last days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They're seducers. Just like the nature of their father, a liar, a traducer, to attack people's character, to destroy them, to bring harm, to bring division. I don't like to leave on that sad note, but you're never going to change without proper correction. I need correction. I need to be corrected. I appreciate men that come to me and say, if you see anything in my life, correct me. I appreciate that. I do. But what's more important is that you really take notice of the word of God. Recognize the spirit of this world is going to lead us into error and lead us no matter who you are. Jesus didn't do his own will. There was nothing in his will that wanted to do anything but what the Father wanted him to do. There's some people, you can read it in the books, there's some people try to figure out the mind and the will of Christ to where some of them, they have, he has a will as a man and he has a will as God. Some people call him God and man. How can you separate it? He's the God man. But how can you separate it for writing purposes and try to figure out in the natural what God is, the Son of God is like? And the more you try to separate it in your mind, your thinking, the far, farther off from, from the truth you're going to get. I'm going to take the simple things that I do know. I'm going to let the Holy Ghost help me in areas that are far beyond me. Jesus said, not my will, so I know he had a will. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. So that's more important for us to know it isn't a matter of just, I've got a will of my own. That'll get you in trouble. Get you in trouble fast. I know you have a will of your own. But he, he told us what to do with that. Surrender it. Submit it to him. Amen. Now is the will of the Father just going to come into you and you're just going to do everything right? Jesus didn't do it that way. He was tempted in all points like as we are. But he constantly continued 
to pray and stay in touch. He didn't need correction because he never did anything wrong. He never failed. He never got discouraged. He never had frustration like you and I have. He wept. He has feelings. He has emotions. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't like our weeping. He wept. More than just because they wouldn't believe him for that moment. He saw eternity. When Jesus cried out on the cross, I don't believe that he was trying to get away from the cross, whether he was praying in the garden or, or the words that he said on the cross. I don't believe he was ever trying to get away from that. Some look at it as like it was so hard, he was wondering if he was going to go through it already. No, I don't think there was ever a question in his mind. The way I see it is that Christ saw that his death was going to seal the doom of the unbeliever. The only provision of salvation was to those that would believe. There was none chosen by God for eternity lost without Christ. You have to choose that yourself. And you choose that by believing or not believing. It's whosoever believeth. It's not these false doctrines that say God ordain some to eternal life and some not to. No, the truth is very easy. God is merciful. Amen. And so we try to take that word correction. We need correction. And it feels like I didn't get too far with it. But um, if I can at least get to the part in your heart, from the head to the heart, I need correction. I need correction continually. I'm not want to get into a position where we just accept our wrong. I want it corrected. I want to see development so that I'm not have to be corrected the same thing over and over again. Because if I laid it on my shoulder and I didn't have to lick them much. Um, I only remember licking my daughter Jessica one time. She might say more. Uh, but I remember licking her one time. And it wasn't hard. It was on her pamper. And she was only a few days old. <laughs> and I, I felt like a fool. But I, I saw something in a baby Red face, mad, angry, and an infant baby, a few days old. And when I spanked that pamper, she, like a grown person, she didn't say anything, she's an infant. But her expression straightened right out. And I, read, I thought of that when I read that verse, and I read that meaning of correction. Straighten them up again. And and I appreciate Jesse. Some stories come to our mind, but we'll have to hold them till later. Correction is needed. Correction is needed. If you love your children, you're corrected. The Lord loves you. He's going to correct you. One last thing. It's strong meat. It's to some, it's like, you preach over my head. I didn't think so. If you listen to the word of God and you read it, I don't think it's so hard as people try to make it out to be. When the scripture says in Revelation chapter 12, he says, man, child. He's not trying to separate this individual as, like he's a man one time and a child another. Just like they try to do it like he's God one moment and then he's a man the next. No, he's a God-man. It isn't man separated from a child. It's a man-child. God-man. Can't separate it. So there's a place to where you could be next to the Lord, overcoming, destroying the works of the devil, and you're still in, a, in that position of humility as a child. It's when you start becoming Man, man, I've been serving God. I've been obeying God. I got power over the devil. I can do this. I can do that. And people praise man. No, man, child, stay humble, stay tender, stay correction in a position to be corrected. At any time, he can bring correction. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you today for this opportunity to speak your word, to hear your word. And it we don't want it just be words. We want it to be 
to where our heart and our spirit is open and ready and eager to accept and to look forward and to apply the correction that you give. We need correction. We need to be corrected. There's a lot of things we talk about sometimes what other people are doing. But we need correction. We need that correction, that full, thorough correction, thorough furnishing, not just the garnishing to where it looks good on the outside or the inside, just looking good, but that we be furnished, that we be complete unto all and every good work, pleasing you, obeying you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Bless your name. Praise you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand for a moment and sing a song. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated if you like. And we're looking for anyone that might have had a birthday this last week or even the week before. But if you did have a birthday, you can come up front. Who is this? Parker? Parker? Praise you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. There is another birthday, but the brother is not here. So today is Brother Will's birthday. So if you see Brother Will, wish him a happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Today? Today. Wow. Mm-hmm. And Happy Brother Jack's birthday. Oh, yes. Three days ago. Let us be blessed with it. We're going to sing happy birthday to Brother Roberts. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, every day of the year. May you feel Jesus near. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, and the best year you've ever had. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Wing, would you ask God's blessing on Brother Roberts? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, we do. Thank you, Father God. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we'll have the Sunday school children come up front. Thank you, Lord. Oh, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank You're so Lord. good to us. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What did Hallelujah. anybody tell us what we learned yeah. about in Sunday school? Self-control. Self-control. Hallelujah. Right? Lord. So that amen. whenever something makes us upset, Thank you, Lord. that we don't get angry real quick, right? So we want Jesus to help us control ourselves. Amen. amen. What happens if they don't? Do they get us straighten up again? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is faithful. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is faithful to correct us if we need to. Thank you, Lord. Help us. He's so good to us. But guess what? He can teach us to not be the self control. Praise you, Jesus. Our All right, we're going to sing the Hall of Life. Put your hands up. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Stephen, can you come up here and do a motion? Yes. That's okay. Get in. We're going to sing the young and high and stretch in life. Make a big line, big stretch in life. Ladder rain is flowing in my soul. Ladder rain is flowing in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Ladder rain is flowing in my soul. Oh, ladder. Go ahead and play it in G. We'll try to find you. 
Was it B-flat? No? Okay. <laughs> Latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Yes, latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Oh, latter rain is falling in my soul. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Brings me joy I can't control. Latter rain is falling in my soul. Amen. The Holy Spirit's in the land. Holy Spirit's in the land. Reach out and touch him while you can. He's in the high, high mountain, the low, low valley. The Holy Spirit's in the land. Oh, yes, oh. kind of goes along with our lesson this yeah. morning in Sunday school. The rain comes for a reason. It's a cause. It's a purpose mm. for the rain. And he says, for correction or for the land. It's your choice. You either let God help you, you either let God bring fruit to your life, Hallelujah. or he's going to bring correction. Now remember this, even if you are fruitful, He's going to prune, purge. There's some things that you miss, that you didn't correct on your own. Amen? Yes, say amen. Amen. Unless you don't know what I'm saying. Amen? <laughs> amen. You, can't, you can't say so be it if, if you don't know what I'm talking amen. about. But if you just don't want to hear it, that's different. But remember this, the scripture says there's going to be an outpouring of God's spirit with sudden destruction. The same Holy Ghost power that came upon you today to bless you, to make you fruitful, to make you grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to come suddenly, the scripture says, and it's going to come with destruction. They're going to listen to a different voice that's going to say peace and safety. The Lord says he's going to send his spirit. Now some are looking for what happened on the day of Pentecost to just go away. Well, in the manner that he came is a small rain compared to what he's going to do in these last days. 
He said that there's going to be the former and the latter rain in the first Amen. month. Amen. There's going to be an outpouring of God's Spirit to prepare His people. The things that we have been looking for, we need to be prepared. Amen? It's going to take the Holy Ghost to prepare us. So, just want to say a few words so that you, you think about what we're singing. We're singing of latter rain. Zechariah 10 and 1, he says, in a time of rain, ask for latter rain. Ask for it. Like Joel prophesied, don't wait for the tribulation hour in the time where he said afterwards, things are going to take place, and afterwards, there's going to be an outpouring of God's Spirit. Where a lot of people preach against that, but there's Joel said, afterwards. After what? Let's not wait to find out afterwards. Let's have God move now. Yeah. Let's, let's receive now. Yeah. Now faith. Yeah. Now's the time. Yeah. How, much do we, how much learning do we have to know that we're living in the last days? Yeah. In the last time. Yeah. And it's a time where he says, ask for rain. Ask for latter rain. And he'll give you that latter rain. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I feel like saying more, but we want to sing about it. We want to worship the Lord. I yes. want you to feel those raindrops. Oh, thank you. Amen. Amen. If it's just a light rain, thank you for yes. the light rain. If it's just a do, you may not feel overwhelmed and, and uh, feel like you're being showered upon, like, like uh, Ezekiel talked about, showers of blessing. Amen. But how about just let the dew of heaven fall upon your yes. thirsting soul. Amen. Amen. Light of rain.
is like the frost. When you want to preserve something, you put it in the freezer. But sometimes the Lord sends us some cold wind. It's not trying to preserve anything. It's trying to get our attention. Oh, Lord, get our attention today. Amen. Oh, let him breathe on me. Let him breathe on me. Oh, let this breath. for correction for the land or for mercy or oh, he will tread for when he speaks. Thank you. 
the legend of his name. Come on, sing that one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Some shout for joy. In Ezra chapter 3, the ancient men wept. The young rejoice. The foundation is finished. You'd have thought the whole building was complete. It's got the foundation. Was the young we are was the young rejoicing? Because it's time to work. Or they rejoice in the Lord and what there was been given them. Because they've never seen it before. What's been talked about, they're now starting to see something. They're starting to get an understanding of what's been talked about. And they're rejoicing so loud. The loudness is increasing. But the ancient men that saw the foundation before it was ruined, they're weeping. Yeah. They, why do some weep and some rejoice? Some shout for joy. There's been many opinions of why the ancient were weeping. I don't know about them, but when I sense the presence of God, I usually begin to weep. I love his presence. I love him. I recognize there's a weakness within, but I know he's here to help me. And I just weep because I, I sense his presence. Amen. But I don't know. It's a serious thing. I thought about it a lot last night. I don't see the glory cloud shining on that foundation, that finished foundation. They were glorifying the Lord. They were praising God. They were rejoicing the Lord. But was his Shekinah glory shining like it did in the desert sand when the tabernacle was raised? The Shekinah presence of God's power, his presence, his glory. Was the ancient men weeping because they weren't seeing something they knew needed to be there? Why do you weep today? Rather than try to figure out them, why do you weep today? Or maybe you're one that's rejoicing. I don't have to look far today. I have to close my eyes because I don't. I want to be merciful. I truly, I want God's mercy. And I want to be merciful. And if I open my physical eyes to all what's going on in people's lives, especially as a pastor, and I was just the pastor's son, I could be quiet. 
because I knew it was not my place. My mother would talk for me to six to eight hours over and over again, over and over again. I told her one time some things, she shared my heart, but usually I would just be quiet and listen because Joe knows, he, he was more vocal than I was. But I knew if I said something, she's gonna explain it to me in another way, so I'd get her understanding. She wanted to make me understand what she was saying. And if I, if I had any way gave a clue that I'm not believing or I'm not looking at it that way, she's gonna keep trying. And I, I appreciate that now. I didn't always, I appreciated her, I always appreciated her. And I appreciated those talks. I'm talking about six to eight hours. The hard part wasn't listening to her. The hard, the hard part, many times, I no doubt, was out underneath that truck working by himself. And when he needed a wrench, I was running to get it both ways. And so when I'm away that long, I knew he's going to be upset with her. I knew he was going to be upset with me. I knew he was going to be upset with her. So it humbled me and humbled me and humbled me. Lord, help me to learn. Help me to learn. Help me to understand what she's saying. Help me to receive. At least help me to be in agreement in a way that, you know, she could see that I'm not against her. But where are we at today? Where are we at now? I could talk all day long with my members of my past. The ancient men had a lot of stories. They were weeping while others were rejoicing. Were they not seeing what they once saw? Let's not just come to somebody else's opinion and just because it was a preached a certain way. You read the next chapter. Don't just camp out in chapter 3. Read, it, read the next chapter. Find out that ancient men been around enough to know that there's some things on the horizon that we have not faced yet. All right. There's some things that have taken place that we're not ready for. And we're excited about building this building, but except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. All right. And you read the next chapter, and you see these men come from everywhere. We want to help you build this building. And Nehemiah was smart enough to know they're not going to build the house of God, living the life that they're living, living that way. He said, no, you're not going to help us. He said, that's it. You're not going to help us. He didn't go into a lot of detail why you're not going to help us build this building. We're going to build this building. Now, um, Ezra said that. But later on, Nehemiah told them as they got lingered around the wall, because Ezra had enough authority and, and Nehemiah's presence coming and going, uh, people would come when he was gone, but when he would come back, they learned to get out, get out of town, or at least get outside the wall. And after a while, he told them, you're not even going to hang around this wall. He says, you hang around this wall, and I'm going to come out there and lay hands on you. You know, sometimes the discipline has to be Sometimes the correction has to be that strong. Mm -hmm. That's not how we live our life. Jesus made a scourge one time in three and a half years. He flipped the tables over twice. He told them the same thing twice in three and a half years. That's merciful. Don't look at that. It's yeah. like every day Jesus went out to try to find wrong. Yeah. No, he saw wrong everywhere. Amen. And he kept saying to them day after day after day, he would heal them. He would heal them all. The rebellious, the hard-hearted, the dark, the cold, the indifferent. He would healed them all. Every shape and size, everything you can think of. He would heal them all. And he would say to them, go and sin no more. Knowing that their sin brought them in that condition. And many of them weren't going to listen to him. They were going to come back the same way. Or many of them wouldn't make it back. Right. But he would still give them that warning. The merciful warning. The gentle shepherd. Go and sin no more. On the strength of his word... You can do that. Yeah. You've tried that on your own. You'll sin before you get through the doors. I'm on now. But you go by his word. Yeah. You obey the word of God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Brother Jerry, you have something on your heart this morning you could share with us? Testimony? Word of praise? Challenge? Amen. Thank you, Lord.
great men of God have passed that said, I just heard it again, won't give his name because I heard it by many men that said, I look into the condition of the church. And I've heard some men say it this way, another man I just heard it just the other night. He said, nobody studies the church and its need more than I do. We're talking about a great man. I believe him. I believe how he preached, how he lived his life, he meant it. He's passed now. Me and Brother Jerry are here. Hallelujah. Glory. Brother Hallelujah. Roberts carried a word last night, the last two nights. Thank you, Thank you Lord. I believe it's timing. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. John called me. He has his family, friends around his table. Listen to Brother Nathan speak the other day. The children didn't even leave the table. After he was done, the children still on the, at the table just thinking about what was said. A message from the father to the son reached into a home. God let it touch our children. That's what the message is given for, to reach the hearts of the children. Amen? It's in our hands now. I'll share a little bit of my heart with you this morning. <clears throat> I've come here today for the same reason that I came Friday night. Same reason I always come. Because I want to fellowship Jesus. And I have to find people that Jesus is in. Because the only way I can fellowship Jesus is fellowship Him and His people. And I find that fellowship here. Friday night when I came, that was my heart's desire to fellowship you, Jesus. When I got here, and Brother Steve had asked Brother Rogers to come up and testify and say something. Brother Rogers began to tell how he was raised, just like I was, in a Christian home, going to church. But there came a time in his life when something changed for him personally. And he began to exhort the young people that they need to be born again. Then Brother Nathan comes up and takes his text out of Matthew chapter 7. He begins to read where Jesus is given an example of God as a father. And that if we ask anything it would be given unto you. And Brother Nathan took the time to emphasize that that was a very personal wording, that it shall be given unto you. And all of that reminded me of when I sat many, many years ago as a very young man in the Monmouth Church, Brother Clayton Allwood's old church before he added on to it. And I was sitting there in a church service and the presence of the Lord was in the place. And all at once, just like a cannon went off, there was a brother Wade that sat on the platform because he played an instrument. And all at once, just like a cannon, he jumped up off that platform and came down to me with so much authority and laid his hand on my shoulder. And God said, why do you doubt And that's all I remember, and I think that's all that he said. Why do you doubt? Or why don't you believe? And something happened down about here. And all I can tell you is it felt physical. It felt like it was about the size of my fist. And I could feel it, something physical down there, and it began to start coming up like this. And I knew what was going to happen. I jumped up out of my seat and I ran to get my face buried so nobody could see it. Because when it came out, it came out and I was bawling and crying. The love of God broke my heart that day. And that day when I left that altar, just like Brother Roger was trying to explain, that day when I left that altar, I knew that I belonged to somebody else. I knew that my life was no longer my own. And that love that broke my heart that day has constrained me. And all 
the years of my life, I have longed for the fellowship of that love. I have longed for the fellowship of my Savior, my Lord. And all the days of my life as a young man, whenever I go out at night and I'm alone and I'm looking up into the, the heavens that He created or I'm feeling the wind on my brow that He created, I'm longing, I'm reaching, I'm feeling after Him. I am communing with Him. I'm basking in His presence. And I sw still that way. Still that way. And then Brother, Brother Greg Roberts preached Friday night. What brought you to this opinion? What is it that brought us to this opinion? I'm still of the same opinion. And I'm still longing and I'm still reaching and I'm still thirsting. And my soul is being fed, but I want to know more about Him. I want a continual revelation. There is a reason why the book that we hold in our hand, we never exhaust it. Even though we read the same things over and over and over again, sometimes it seems new and it seems fresh. And there's a continual revelation because the depth of it, it can maybe only be described as the depth of the ocean. But you can't exhaust it because there's layer on top of layer and there's depth on top of depth. Because that, that's who God is. That's what He's like. And to, to know Him is uh, 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 ever a, a lifetime of pressing in for more revelation. And then Sister April gets up today and talks about the mustard seed. We all know that. We're familiar with that. But yet, trying to trying to feel after, trying to understand what is it that she's seen again in that Scripture. Again. Whatever you ask. If you have this one. That was new to me again today. A grain of mustard seed. That's not her words. That's not any of our words. That's the words of our Lord. And that is true. And I'm still of that opinion. Whatever we ask, if we have a grain of mustard seed, we can receive it from Him. I'm still of that opinion. I've had this conversation with a couple of people recently. My great Aunt Muriel, uh, I don't remember her saying it. I don't remember her saying it, but Brother Alva told me. He said, your great Aunt Muriel used to say, we'll never grow if all we talk about is what we don't have. And I said, well, I, I like that. And I needed to hear that. We can talk about what we don't have. And we can acknowledge it. But if we get in, if we get in that rut, if we get in that mind frame, we will never grow. Because there is another opinion. There is another truth. And there's still living water. And that living water still flows. That faith can still be possessed. And we can still receive the promises. And God is just as real as He ever was. He hasn't changed. He hasn't, he hasn't withholding himself from anybody. And I heard a man say recently, can't remember who it was. Seems like it was somebody that we're all familiar with. But he was saying, we can have a move of God. We're always talking about a move of God. We need a move of God in our churches. Well, we sure do. But this man brought it right down. We can ha have a move of God right in here. I can have a move of God. It was somebody that was here. The last person that was here. I can't think of the name. I can have a move of God right in here. And if I have a move of God right in here, then it's going to affect some things that I'm praying about. Some people and children that I care about. I'm waiting for the church to have a... No, no, no. You have a move of God right here. Things will change. I love the Lord, and I love fellowship in Him. And I was over there with my eyes closed a few minutes ago. And I was thinking, I didn't hear Sister Wing. Sister Wing here, I looked over. And Sister Wing's here. And I looked, and Brother Phil Carl's right there, and Brother Robert Carl's right there. And I said, oh, that's good. That's good. I like some stable in my fuel when I put my things away for the winter 
that stable does quite a job. And I like to see that stable in the churches that I go to. I just want to fellowship Jesus with you. I appreciate this meeting so far today. I'm not preaching, but I'm just giving you. I'm just trying to be obedient to my brother. He asked me to share my heart. I'm sharing my heart. I appreciate this meeting today. Because as we come in here today, there is nobody that's trying to wind something up. Sometimes when you wind something up, you can be successful at doing it. But you know, when the wind blows on top of the water, it gets awful sloppy. But when God moves, he moves in the depth. And that current is strong enough to, to move ships off their anchors. That's the strength of my God. That's the strength of the deep movement of God's spirit in his people. And, and the power of God. Me and Brother Nathan was just talking just yesterday. And, and it was about the message. And, and I told him a story. And I said, see, God still is moving. God is moving all around us. And if we get blind or ignorant to those things, we're going to grieve God. And we're going to displease him. Because he deserves glory. And he is moving. And we need to recognize that God is working. God is moving. Yeah, his ways are not our ways. But we need to, we need to be, have our eyes open so that we can see his ways. I just want to worship Jesus today. I'm in a good place. And you're in a good place. To fellowship Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God is faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Don't want to take your time. Don't want to take any time. Just want you to do what the Lord wants you to do. Want you to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. God is faithful. Thank you, Lord. God is working. He's working in us. Amen. I started that verse. I know there's a lot of verses I didn't finish, but you can go home and finish it. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And verse 13, for it is the Lord that worketh in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. God has spoken good concerning his people over and over again. God speaks good concerning his people when they don't even do well. That's why we can look to the good and not look to the bad. Press forward. Press on. Don't look back to their problem or even yours. There's a time when your part of the matter has to be dealt with. There's a lot of unfinished business. That's why it says in Zechariah where, where the spirit of grace and supplication is poured out, it takes the next two verses. It talks about apart, 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 apart. Kings apart and their wives apart. Princes apart and their wives apart. Governors apart and their wives. Why does it keep mentioning their wives too over and over again? You know, husband and wife supposed to be as one. Supposed to be as one. That shouldn't be a mystery. Amen? The Godhead is one. The family should be one. A marriage relationship should be one. A body with many members, but we should be one body, one fold, one shepherd, one Lord, one spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Can you understand the word of God when our spirit is in tune with God like he intended it to be? God desires our worship. He seeks true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Without the Holy Ghost, we don't even have to pray as we ought, let alone worship God as we ought. But with the Holy Ghost, we can learn how to pray. Amen. Are you learning more about the Holy Ghost? Are you learning? In 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, it says that we need to be communicating with the Holy Ghost. Amen? I don't believe that the Holy Ghost seeks you to worship Him. 
the Father seeketh such to worship him. The Holy Ghost seeks you to worship the Father and the Son. The Holy Ghost was sent by the Father and sent by the Son. And you can blaspheme Christ, but you can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So all those things help me to recognize the Godhead is powerful. And it's not as mysterious as some people make it out to be. When you can look at the family and see what God designed for us to have a plain understanding of, he wants oneness in his family. The Father, God is the Father. Now how could Jesus be the Father? Father in creation. You know this world was spoken to existence by the Son as well as the Father. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Amen. He upholds all things by the Word of His power. He spoke these things into existence. He spoke it into existence before the foundations of, of the world, before anything began. He spoke all these things in existence. I don't know God. But I don't sit there try to figure out, Lord, did you send rain today because you just wanted to do this today for a certain reason? Or did you do that way back then because you're just God? See, I can't figure that out. I know he's God. I know the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are one, like a family's one. I don't try to put it like I'm the family. If you know me, you know the whole family. No, you don't. I don't, I don't try to take things out of proportion. I just try to take it in the proportion that he gives it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'd like to read your scripture. Amen. I won't tell you what else I'd like to do because it scares people. But I would like for you to love him. Think about his word. Think about his word. Think about what he's saying. Not just scripture written in the page. See, God knew the heart of Israel, so he wrote the law on a rock. You know that? Because he knew the heart of his people, so he wrote it on a rock. He knew the heart of the people today, so he put it on the page. He knows people. He knows their heart. God knows everything about you. And he does not want us to just go by the letter, because the letter in itself could be, in my mind, I'm not going to change the letter, but in my mind, the letter can mean a lot of things. There's people who try to make it out to be a lot of things. There's no private interpretation, but people sure try to interpret it. Okay? If you turn to me in Psalms 104. Psalms 104. In verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. On the Mount Transfiguration, the disciples got a glimpse of that. Clothed. His garments were glistening. Amen. Now, there's a big difference. Physical garments glistening. That happened to Jesus on the Mount Transfiguration. But I believe the psalmist saw something more than just the outward dress of the Lord. Do you know his character and his righteousness, his dress for you and I? Put off the old world, the old man, put on the new. Put on his righteousness, be clothed in his righteousness. Psalms 103 and verse 1, bless the Lord, probably every one of us could say that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Remember that? Did you forget that? that? That's talking about what Brother Jerry was just saying. Everything within you. You talk about what's in somebody else and you may want to complain. You may even get worried. You might even get frustrated. But you bless him. Amen? And bless the Lord with everything within you. And if there's something inside of you that needs to come out, let it come out. Let it be dealt with. You bless the Lord. There's something there that's ugly or hesitant or doubtful or fearful. Let it come out. Bless the Lord 
Oh, my soul and all that is within me. You can have revival from what is within you. He works in you. And he wants you to work that out, that which he's worked in. Not the problems you see, not the problem you got yourself in or, or allow somebody to get you in. But bless the Lord, oh, my soul and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. In verse, or chapter one, chapter 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh Lord, my God. See, our attention gets more and more on him. Your worship will become more true. You talk about who you are, what you've done, how you feel. You might not even worship God. You may not even feel like your worship is accepted. But David, I'm not here to tell you all about David, but David found that place. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It's time to get more involved. The devil's trying to say, give up. Give it up. Give it up, David. And he may speak your name. Give it up. But the Lord is saying, I'm worth it. I seek you to see my worth. The Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, thou art very great. I don't care who you are. He's great enough to change who you are. He's great enough to deal with who you are, the way you are. Amen? Now, there's times where I have to get beyond this thought that people come, the Lord knows how I am. In fact, they even believe that God just made them this way. The Lord made me this way. And he's going to use me for his glory. God gets no glory. Paul said, my past life, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a man of the law. He, he was high up there. But he says, I count that all down. I see now my wrong. I was the chief of sinners because I persecuted the one that could make me something, worth something. He's very great. He's very great. Amen. Thou art very great. You can say that. You can mean that. I'm not encouraging sin. I'm not encouraging sinners to just stay where they're at and praise God. But wherever you're at, he's great. He's very great. He's able to deal with the sinner at his feet. The Pharisee said, don't you realize who she is, what she's done, and what she's like? They all knew her to be a sinner. But he saw something changing, transpiring. As she began to respond to his word, she fell at his feet and she worshipped him. And the, the worst sinner was the man that was trying to get rid of her. The Lord says, I come in here, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't greet me like she did. You didn't fall on your face before me and weep before me like she did. But from the time she came in, she's fallen at my feet. And she's worshipped me. And she's washed my feet with her tears. And she took her covering. What left she, what little bit she might have had left. And she wiped his feet. Amen. Now some people are wondering how long is long. Hey, if you understood true worship. And there's a place at Jesus' feet where tears begin to cleanse and wash his feet. And your hair is a covering uh, to use it as part of the worshiping of the Lord, amen, it will help stop a lot of arguments, amen. It isn't a matter of how long your hair is. This people got long hair, can't worship God. I don't know how long her hair was. Uh, if she was Mary Magdala in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, says she was manned by seven devils. Can you imagine have seven different personalities, not just uh, personalities, but seven demons telling you what to do, how to dress, how not to dress, what to do, when to do it, where to do it. But Jesus set her free. I don't know the name of that woman in Luke chapter 7. She, they're calling her a sinner. But Jesus is seeing somebody that's leaving sin behind, leaving sin at his feet and worshiping him. Amen. I don't know how you came in this morning. I don't know what you thought of yourself. I don't know what you thought of others, but he's very great. He's great. He's worthy of your praise. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how difficult it's been, he's worthy of your praise. He's very great. No matter what word you choose, he is magnificent. He's huge. He's wonderful. He's marvelous. 
I don't know your vocabulary. It might be just praise the Lord, bless the Lord, something simple. Bless his name. Bless the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. He'll have the praises of his people. Where there's a people that will worship God, the Lord will make himself known. He'll make himself real. He'll change you inside. You go to situations that you once faced or, or been thinking about facing, you'll find you're facing it with a different mind. Not just a different mind, but the spirit of your mind is established now. Before it was like wishy-washy, here, there, everywhere, just uh, faith and then foolishness. But the spirit of your mind is renewed in the presence of God. You find that establishment in your mind, a, a rock-solid strength that he has made. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Amen. The last verse, Psalms 104, verse 35. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise ye the Lord. Now, you could get judgmental. You could become skeptical. You could become self-righteous. You can become hypocritical. There's a lot of things you could become. But how about bless the Lord, worship God, true worship, worship him. You don't know that person. You don't know that guy. You don't know that girl. But listen, he's worthy of your praise. He can reach into the hearts of people. One day he's going to judge sinners. One day he's going to deal with them. But look at how the grace of God dealt with them on the cross. When one was so vile and so vulgar that he just came to the opinion that Jesus is not like us. And that he's my savior. He's Lord. To the point where he spoke out and he said, Lord, remember me. And all of a sudden, the word of God reached his heart. Today, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He could have been lost forever. He came that close. He's the dying thief. He's the thief on the cross. And he could have went out into eternity lost without God. But it shows us he's very great. He can save. He can save. He can save, and he can save with honor and majesty. That's a sinner. Yes, that's a sinner. But it's glory and honor and praise unto my God. For once I was a sinner, but now I am forgiven. Now I am cleansed. Now my soul is set free from the penalty of sin, the penalty of breaking his laws and breaking his heart. What's worse, breaking the law of God or breaking the heart of God? See, under the law, people think you follow the writing that he gave in the rock, and you'll be okay. And uh, 613 commandments ended up coming up onto their pages, and it didn't make them any more saved. And the, and the Lord says, you go by the law, the law says this. You commit adultery, he says, the law says they are to be stoned. But he says, under grace, he says, if you think it in your heart, you don't even have to go do the act. Just think it in your mind. Right while you're sitting in church, you realize the acts that people commit right in the house of God. The devil blinds their mind from the truth of blessing the Lord with all their soul. They, they don't even feel like they're worthy. And if, and if they even had a feeling, it's like, amen, hallelujah. He's worthy of all our praise, all our honor. And I like, I like what David said, Lord, you, you cleanse my heart, create him in a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Take not thy Holy Ghost from me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And he said, then I'll teach transgressors your ways. I'm not going to teach him a whole lot doing what I've been doing, but you do a little bit more for me today. You change my heart, cleanse my heart, renew my mind, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. 
Take not thy Holy Ghost from me. I'll teach transgressors thy ways. That's not arrogance. That's boldness. That's faith. That's obedience. God wants you to be a part of teaching transgressors. The word teaching in Matthew 28, 19, remember the great commission the Lord gave to his disciples? The word teaching means make disciples. That's what that word means. Make disciples. Discipline them. Who wants to be first? Who, who, wants, to, who wants to be disciplined by me? No? I must not be much. And I appreciate that part if you're looking at it right. Amen? I can miss something. If I'm not careful, I could abuse you. It's possible. That he won't. He will not abuse you. You could be a smoking flax, and he won't quench that fire, that little bit of smoke, to go out, and there'd be nothing left. You could be a broken reed. The reed is very thin. The wind could blow and finish the break, and he won't break you. He's the disciplinarian. He's the disciplined one. He's perfect in his touch. He's perfect in his word. He's perfect in his dealings. He's great. He's very great. He's great. He's very great. He is. He's everything his word says he is. Amen. I believe that we need to increase not just our vocabulary, but to understand the words that we use so that they would have more meaning to us. God understands every word. God knows every word, every meaning. I have to look up words. And even after I look it up, a lot of times they use the word that I'm looking up to describe it. And I haven't learned a thing yet. Other than I think they might know what they're talking about. But I don't know what they're talking about. So if you want to use the word correction, you're going to have to use another word other than correction. Amen? I looked up correction, and it says straightening out again. Well, I can understand that. My daddy told me bend over, and when he did his job, I, my job was to straighten up. And I didn't mean to do better and do good and be a good boy. And then when he hit me, it made me stand up straight. You bend over again. You hit me and maybe stand up. Now you straighten up. I didn't learn that quick enough as a child. Hey Amen. He wasn't just trying to go through some annex and just object lessons. He's trying to discipline, try to teach us something. And he'd say, Now straighten out. Now straighten up. Bend over. <clears throat> and I stood up because I knew what was coming. I tried to escape what was coming. He said, now straighten out. And I knew, I knew what he was saying there. There's something in obeying the Lord that is far better than anything else. How about, let us learn from obeying the Lord. Amen? We read verse 1, we read verse 35. Would you look at verse 27? I don't want to take this out of context, but I want to see the context that it's given, that I can see more than just the surface. You know, if you're not careful, you read and only see the surface. Some people, their mind is trying to spiritualize something, they don't even see the surface. But we're talking here in Psalms 104 about God as the creator, and he's the creator of all things, and he created all things good, and he's great, and he's very great, and everything he does is great. And if you let him work in you, it's great. God wants to do something great in your life. He wants to do great things in you, with you, through you. He's able. Amen. You're not great. He's great. And you'll never be great in yourself. But in him, it's so great salvation. So great. And your worship can be great. And your relationships can be great. And your fellowship can be great. And leadership can be great. And all the things that the Lord has for us can be great. In verse 27, or verse 26, Psalms 104, verse 26. Simple phrases. Somebody help me. There go worship. I'm not trying to take it out of context, 
He's talking about ships of the sea. But what's more important, beneath that current, deep into the current, when you get into a place where you worship God, and then you come to a place, you're living on the surface, shallow. No worship. There goes worship. Somebody help me. Verse 26, there go the leadership. Somebody else. There go the fellowship. There go the friend what? Friend what? Somebody's catching on. There go the ships. What happened? He created all things good. What happened? What happened? Now, before you go quickly to Leviathan and try to figure out what that is, do you know Leviathan is a type of that great sea creature that God made good? What happened? What happened? What happened? Fellowship. Worship, leadership, friendship, apart, 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 divided. Thank God you bring us together. Worship, friendship, leadership, fellowship. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Maybe somebody else knows what the ships are about. Amen. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan. All things that the Lord made is good. But you start taking away from what God has given. You take away worship, the worth in worship. You got a ship. Paul said it like this, in good conscience. It used to bother me because I didn't understand what was going on. But I see a lot of people in good conscience go right down the wrong road. And they think they're doing God's service. What did he mean? He says, in good conscience, they put away faith. Has it been they've been lied to? Has it been they've lied to themselves so long that they believe it? So that now their conscience can't even change. In their mind, in their conscience, it's like, it's good. It's good. In fact, after he even talked about pure conscience, that really got me. But it took a few years before I even put that together. There's people who think their conscience is good, even to the point where their conscience is pure. And they can say things contrary to the will and mind of God. And there go the ships. And there go Leviathan. And it's not good. It's not what God created. It's not what God created. And we're not... Thank you, Brother Jerry, for sharing that today. We're not going to dwell today a lot on what God didn't create. Let's bless the Lord with everything within us, right where we're at. Amen? With our focus on Him. Worship Him. Praise Him. Exalt Him. Love Him. Look to Him. It's too quiet. There goes Leviathan. See, when the ships, no more worship, no more leadership, no more friendship, no more those things. There's a long list. Going, going, going. Many times gone, just gone, so far gone. But in the midst of that, I'd like for you one more time, hear the voice of God one more time. Be touched by the Spirit of God. Let Him draw you. You read the book of Job. Get the message right. Can Satan come in the presence of God? He can until somebody puts him out. You read Revelation chapter 12, it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm sharing to you, why not you be in a place that God could prepare you as the man-child, as the grown-up one spiritually, to where you're totally submitted to the Lord, rather than get caught on terms where a lot of people, they try to make Jesus a man-child in Revelation chapter 12, and that's a book of prophecy, when he's talking about a, a 
period of a time of these last days where God is going to prepare people and use the people to put the devil out of his place. Jesus exposed the devil for what he was when he was on the cross, and he destroyed his works at that time, and he brought salvation in, into uh, where we could see it, we could grasp it so much easier. Abraham saw it before Jesus ever went to the cross. Abraham saw the crucifixion. I've never been to the Golgotha. I've never been to Calvary in the natural, but I can say I've seen the Lord. I can say I've been to Calvary. I can say that experience that I have is more real if you put me on a plane and sent me over there. My experience is real, and I thank God for that. But there's a lot of people, they're, the way of their getting things, their fellowship is not of the Lord. Not as it should be, not in the truth, not rejoicing in the truth, not walking in the truth, not walking in the light. There's a lot of problems, but let's, let's get above that. Let's, you and I recognize we can worship God. We can praise God. Job was worshiping God. He was praying for his family. He was praying for them, but the Lord brought him to a greater test. If you're praying for your family, you're doing it right. If you're praying for your family and you've been washed in the blood, you're saved, uh, you're born again. When you're born again, you're born of God, you're born of his spirit, and he forgives you of all your past sins. When you repent and come to the Lord, he, Romans uh, chapter 3, 23 is talk, and 24, it's talking about all your past sins are forgiven. Not your past, present, and future sins. It's your past sin that you've repented of, and he takes it all away and forgives you. Now, be careful. Some people, uh, I don't know who needs this, but I hear a lot of people sometimes that say, the Lord takes your sin, casts it in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you again. And it sounds good in a song, but you try to find that in the Bible, and you'll find only portions of what they're saying. And the truth is, God is able to forgive you, and he can even, he's God, he can forget your sin. He's that great. That's great. It's great for him to forgive me. It's very great he's forgiven me. But it's very great that he could forget it. He can do that. He's God. But the part the devil don't want you to know, doesn't want you to know, that God can remember your sin against you if he so chooses. He's God. He can do that. There's some that are born out of due time. There's some that, are, that ended their life as one that never had been anointed. Many in this day, you're going to stand before God in the day of judgment, and they're going to hear, I never knew you. Done many wonderful works in his name, and they're going to hear the Lord say, I never knew you? How can you, how can you number me with those that never knew you? He's God. He's God. His judgment is right. His judgment is just. So if there goes the ships, no more worship, no more leadership, no more friendship, no more fellowship. It isn't where we should be. It isn't where the Lord intended for us to be. He can bring his judgment. Call it kingship. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And there's some that are rising and call himself kings and lords. And he's so merciful and gracious at this time. He's king of kings and lord of lords no matter who you are. But one day, every king, every lord is going to bow before Christ. And they're going to have to answer to God. So in this service this morning, we have an opportunity to give ourselves fully to the Lord. Amen? Give ourselves fully to him. To put into a, just a nutshell, Job had to learn there's a devil. He had to learn there's a daysman. He had to learn not just go by what you hear. Even if you've heard from God, you need to see him for yourself. You need to walk with him. You need to stay with what he's doing because our version of what God said doesn't work. Our version of what God said will fail us. God's word doesn't fail, but our version of what God said fails us. We forget. We change. We add. We take away. And so when you read the book of Job, you'll see that the Lord is going to teach the world a lesson. He's going to teach the devil a lesson. The Lord could say, devil, you be judged forever and be gone out of my sight and know nothing but the wrath of God forever right now.
But the Lord said, I'm going to choose an overcomer to put him out of his place. And his place will be no more. He could have used his son, that perfect sinless one. He used his son to provide salvation. The first begot, the only begotten and the firstborn of the dead. And those are tremendous blessings and great privileges, great promises. And I'm looking forward to understand every promise. I don't like fighting the devil. I don't like that. And we can't fight the devil on our own. And this idea, let me get at him, I'll, sh I'll show him a thing or two, he'll destroy you. But if, if the man child, put that in right language, the person that is developed in their faith, developed in the wisdom and the power and the anointing of God, developed in his majesty, in his honor, will stand so that God can glorify himself in the life of one that is totally submitted to him. God is going to use that one to put the devil out of his place. You don't believe that? You watch. You'll see it happen. It'll be too late for some, but there'll be a catching up later. There'll be a catching up later. He said he'll nourish them for three and a half years in the wilderness. Nourish them with what? The things that we have been given right now, amen, the same teaching, the same word, the same promises, not another gospel. But the same gospel is going to be taught and nourish them. Amen. That word correction has to do with nourish and nurture and discipline. And many times people think of all the wrong things. We need the word of God. Amen. This is the best rod. Let us feed from it. When Aaron's rod budded, it came forth with almonds. Amen. And that ain't just for show. It isn't just to look at. God wants us to find the fruit of his word developing in us more and more and more and more. Today, you can go home with serpents like the magicians are in rule and control of your thinking, or you can go home like an Aaron where his rod, his serpent, ate up all their serpents, and he didn't go home with a serpent. He went home with a rod. I'm not satisfied to see in miracles. I'm not satisfied to just demonstrate that this gospel's true. I want to see the reality of that in my life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There goes the ships, and there's that Leviathan. God said to Satan, he said, I am going to let you touch his family, touch everything he has, but don't touch his body. The devil took everything he had except his wife. Some people look at it differently. I look at it like she's a lady. She's a praying one too. She survived the attack. Amen. And I'm not just talking about Job's wife. You don't even know her name. God put some of those experiences in there just to help us to see that when everyone else around us is attacked, you still stand and praise them for it. Amen. If there's something within her, so sometimes uh, I don't believe she lived that way, but at a moment, she says, curse God and die. Every man of God has momentary doubts, not to excuse them, but you have to face the reality of men of God fail. Men of God have momentary doubts, that they have fears, they have questions, they say wrong things. It shouldn't be, but we have, and we need help. Not to excuse it, not to excuse anybody, but you're not excused because you have, and you know you have, and you know you have many times, multiple times, it's no excuse to keep failing. Let the Lord help you. Job's wife, come through it. You can. And there she is. Job is being tempted. And the Lord says, take not only everything he has, now you touch his body. Don't take his life. thing that I'm saying this for is because a lot of times people think that God took away the hedge of protection from Job. In the manner that God had given him and the faith that he had and the light that he had, God says you're perfect and upright. But he found out that praying for his friends in a time of tragedy and deepest trouble, there was a hedge of protection through the prayer of faith that would destroy all the works of the devil that Job would never have learned if he didn't go through that test. So simply, bring an hour's message or three hours or four hours. I'm slow, but down to a minute. The hedge is down, 
and Leviathan is out, and there goes the ships. That's the negative. But the bright part is, Lord, I want to worship you. I know you haven't failed me, and your hedge of protection is through Christ. He never failed anyone. He never got discouraged. It looked like we were left all alone without protection. It's only in sin when we did it our way, when we thought our opinion was the way to go. No, our opinion will lead us astray. Amen? And God is merciful, and he was good to them that day, and he healed them all because he's God, and he's very great. But there comes a time we've got to learn. Amen? Like Brother Roberts was telling us, it's not in Peter, and it's not so much in a shadow, but it was the way that God chose to use it to get them to an opinion that the power of God can be manifested in small ways. And I thought of Sister April uh, when he was preaching that, because she told me the other day, I have this mustard seed message I want to share with the people. Can I do that? I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love the word of God comes in all shapes and sizes, seed form, let it be. But there comes a time, Lord, he's going to send some rain to all this seed, to all these truths, to all this teaching, to all this instruction, to all this correction. Amen. And some of you, you know I'm, you know I'm merciful, and you know I'm kind, but some of you are going to face the worst destruction because you won't listen. You come when you want. You do what you want. You say what you think. You say what you feel. I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you, you. You, you, you. You know who you are. And he wants to help you. He wants to help you. He wants to change you. You want to change everybody else. We do... We all do have a, a measure of that. But I want the real change. Amen. I want the real change. Now there's some, they're not even here to hear what I'm trying to say. God many times tried to reach out to Israel and they would not hear. They chose not to hear. From their youth up, they chose not to hear. There goes the ships. Let it be turned around today in the way that God created there goes the ships. Let's not let it go alone. Amen. Somebody with a revival in their heart all by themselves could go out there, face Le Leviathan. Amen. God gives you the strength and power. Greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. You can do that. You can take the ship of Zion by yourself. The Lord directing one man and can defeat the work of the devil. But God chose Fellowship, worship, leadership, amen, friendship, working together, amen. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We appreciate you. We want your best. We want your will. We want your way. Lord, you know how to do it. You know how to reach inside of us. You know how to touch the spot when no one else could reach. You are faithful. You are merciful. You are very great. You are so kind, so true, so patient. I pray, Lord Jesus, an awakening, true. Not like they're talking about in the airways everywhere, but a real, genuine awaken up to righteousness, serving the Lord, living for you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together.